Today is the uh, 19th of July. So what I'm filming here is um, a good portion of my uh, martins have fledged their youngs, at least the older birds have. What you see up there are these light color, these light chested ones. These are all were babies last year, and they returned as uh, what they call sub-adult birds. They're able to reproduce, but they don't have their adult coloring yet. So these are the birds that return later, about a month later than the, the, the adult birds. So they're about a month behind in their uh, uh, reproductive efforts. So their young are usually the, the latter ones to fledge. Now, what I wanted to film, and the only reason I was filming this is because um, I had uh, I had a friend stop over yesterday that's had Martins for, I think, maybe 30 years. And he's complaining to me that he's, he, at his highest level of, of pairs, he had 22. And he's down to nine. He's got a dying colony. His colony's dying. And part of it is because he let the trees grow up. And he doesn't want to cut down the trees. I know he doesn't want to cut down the trees. And I told him, you're not going to get any more birds unless you put up. He never got more than 15 to 20 pairs. And he never added more houses. That's kind of the key. And the other key is you can't... You can't let the trees grow up. I mean, it's, it's 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 real simple. You either want martins or you want trees. You can't have both. Now, I know this is a little crazy considering there's trees over there, but those are not my trees. And I put these birdhouses in the furthest area away from the trees. And this is why I got a birdhouse in my front yard because I got martins in the front yard before they came to the back. So I keep the area kind of tree free as you can see, you know. But one I wanted to talk about here was what I wanted to talk about was um, I told him his county is in decline. You're probably, you know, if you're not getting a recruitment of these younger birds, forget it. It's you're not gonna your colony's gonna die. And there is something that I have not been able to, well, let's, let's put it this way. There's more going on here than just a bunch of birds nesting. These are probably the most social species of birds that this country has. And um, because they nest in colonies like this, there is something that you probably can't scientifically see that they they somehow or another put some type of a unseen mark, let's say, on a place where they nest. This is what I've noticed. If a colony starts to die, they they somehow and they somehow know it and the colony dies and good luck getting them back if you get a colony that thrives and keeps thriving the the numbers will always be high there's some kind of unseen force at work um i don't think any i don't think a lot of people a lot of people with martins realize this there is something unseen at work when it comes to how they nest and, and the places they choose to nest, they, they put some type of a vibe on it. A colony that's starting to dwindle, uh, if you can't pull it back from that brink of disaster, it's gonna die. These colonies tend to die with their owners. I've seen that, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. But one I wanted to touch on besides this was, so, I recently read something 
that they say that there's like a hundred thousand purple martin colonies registered with the purple martin conservation association a hundred thousand now that may sound like a lot to you but if you take into account a hundred thousand meaning uh from alberta canada and east of the mississippi river from the gulf uh, all the way to um, maine it's not a lot a hundred thousand is not a lot and i don't know how big any of those colonies are now now let's just say now my colony is very large i got 94 pairs of birds be careful hon so um i got 93 pairs i had 93 last year I got 300 and it looks like I'm going to fledge about 340 babies, which is probably the best year I ever had. But see, here's the kicker. If you got 100,000 colonies of these birds east of the Mississippi River, um, it's not a lot. It really isn't. So, And that's registered. So let's say there's another 100,000 that aren't registered, like mine okay and you still don't know what kind of numbers you're working with so let's just say on for the sake of argument there's 200,000 colonies of these birds east of the Mississippi River that still is not a lot of birds as a whole it's not a lot and the area that I live this is a this, this is a precarious place now this friend of mine that came over he's only 20 miles to the south of me and his numbers are dwindling so 20 miles for one of these birds is nothing to fly nothing these guys can can go 20 miles easily and, and rather quickly they're strong flyers and they and they spend all their time in the air these birds do not hang around on the ground you will never see these birds walking around on the ground unless they're picking up nest material or if they're uh, uh, looking for grit, like on a beach. These are not birds that are walking around on your lawn like a starling or a grackle or a robin. They don't do that. They're in the air, they drink on the air, they bathe on the air, in the air, and they take their food in the air. So mm, this is my thing. These birds are in a really precarious situation as far as reproduction and population wise and at least in the northern part of the range and from what I understand the southern part is starting to decline because people are not putting up birdhouses like this and they're not managing these birds um, these birds need to be managed because you cannot just put up a birdhouse and get them and forget about them you can't do that there's a yeah there's a, what I call the eternal house sparrow problem which is uh, the probably the number one problem with these birds at this point uh, they can't coexist they destroy the house sparrows destroy their nest kill their young um, and the problem with modern people in this country they're too weak to deal with the house sparrow problem because you have to deal with house sparrows with extreme prejudice and you got to do deal with them with hardcore control methods just live and let live does not work here and trying to get other people involved in this interest they just don't want to do what it takes because they're I'm sorry they're freaking weak they can't take care of business if you know what I'm talking about it's called about dispatching you got to dispatch the house barrels with extreme prejudice and most people can't do it they're soft and I mean I feel bad in a sense because our ancestors were not like this you know I mean when you design mouse traps that are disposable so you don't have to look at the mouse that's pretty pathetic that's that's really pathetic if you go and buy a mouse trap and they got these mouse traps that are meant to be disposable so whoever's catching the mouse doesn't have to look at it it's, it's pathetic our ancestors your, your great-grandmother just for an example 
your great grandmother could walk out into the, the 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 farmyard, grab a chicken for dinner, and 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 kill it, gut it, skin it, and cook it, and not think anything of it. Your your great grandmother. But now, oh God, forget it, forget it. I mean, it's just it's it's aggravating, it's upsetting. But what bothers me is I know that when I'm gone. I don't know if I'll be able to pass this on to anybody because there's no young people taking an interest in this. There's none. And everybody that's into Martins were exposed to Martins as a child. I was exposed to Martins by it as a child. And I regained the interest in my 20s. And it took me 20 years to attract a single pair. That tells you there's a population problem right there. So I guess my, the reason I made this video was that there is a, there's a plea to help these birds. But please, stay away from them if you can't do what's necessary to make them thrive. I don't play games with this, I tell people all the time. And, and anybody that's involved in bluebirds knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't have the ability to take care of business with Purple Martins, then you have no business trying to house them. Um, i got to tell you that they are a delight to have because it's really nice to wake up to this sound in the morning for at least several months out of the year. I look forward to them coming and I look forward to them leaving. I look forward to their return and I look forward to them leaving. Um, I already have my, my uh, improvements I'm going to make for next year. And I'm going to hope even for a better season next year. So this is, this is really a big passion for me. And I would love to educate people. I would love to lecture on this. I would love to do this. But it's very discouraging. Because I have done it in the past. And you get nobody that wants to do what's necessary. They love to be entertained with the stories and the pictures and the slideshow and the videos. But nobody wants to spend the money, put up a decent Martin house. Not one of those cheap plastic ones made by a company called S and K. What a horrible product. Anyway, uh, I can make a lecture on that one just alone. But anyway, um, I just thought I would do this before they... Um, decided to fly the coop <laughs> and just I'm gonna go over to this house over here real quick and if you can see the babies hanging out of the hole on the left side second from the top you see them see all their heads sticking out of there yeah that's you know, they're, they're waiting to be fed. And those guys ain't going to be around much longer. The parents will coax them out and they'll be out in the air. And then coming here at night, they're using the place as a roost for the night. And uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite a sight to see. And maybe I'll film that tonight or tomorrow. All right. I hope that was educational. Till next time.